Well, folks, welcome to our first Patreon exclusive live interview uh, in about a month. This is Professor Gisli Sigurdsson of the Alkney Magnuson Institute for Icelandic Studies in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, Gisli is one of the top living scholars of Norse myth and literature today. And his edition of the Eddic poems is a really uh, fantastic way to read them, uh, especially uh, if you can make use of the modern Icelandic commentary. So, Gisli, could you tell us a little bit uh, to start with about what you presented at the conference in uh, Helsinki uh, back in, what, July or August? You know, in Helsinki, I, I was going about um, uh, the landscape in Iceland. So oh, is that the, it? Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, but um, uh, that was sort of part of a, a larger project that... Um, I'm just trying to tie together the uh, the Eddas and the sagas and uh, see what um, how they reflect a, a culture of storytelling and poetry that uh, is interwoven with the uh, landscape and skyscape, if you like, that people uh, have in front of their eyes. And uh, what I was uh, doing in uh, in Hel Helsinki and and Tallinn was. Um, so take an example of one saga that uh, is set in the uh, West Fjords of Iceland and uh, just analyze how th that particular saga so describes uh, both land routes and land qualities in the area, how you get to ports here and there, how you travel across land, uh, how you rest here on these farms and then you make them memorable by telling of some event that happened there that is then associated with the place name and the description of how to get to the to the site and uh, that is um, something similar to the um, notion of uh, of song lines in Australia that people learn how to get from A to B by learning the uh, the place names and um, stories attached to them and you know when you have reached a place then that matches a description and um, then you know how to get from there and continue your journey. And uh, uh, by uh, including directions and descriptions of the land uh, within the storytelling tradition, that is how uh, the uh, stories in an oral culture have also a practical function, not only the entertaining, uh, literary ple pleasing uh, function that we, of course, know well and uh, enjoy, but also this very practical a uh, function of mediating knowledge about the environment and uh, and the world we live in. And which saga uh, were you no, using? That was, your... uh, that, that was uh, Fosbræra saga, mostly, that I was uh, focusing on. Saga of the uh, Sworn Brothers, the two, Thorgeir and Thormod, that uh, so conveniently travel around a bit, and uh, so you can get uh, to know all the main main roads in the area, both in the, the difference between the winter and summer season also. Uh, in the winter, you can travel on ice here and there, and you can make uh, go through passes that uh, are too wet or uh, too difficult to get through in um, other seasons and so on. So it's uh, quite a convenient saga to um, look at this particular uh, aspect of the storytelling tradition, even though it is also one of the uh, most humorous and entertaining stories to read in its own right. Sure. Well, and, and uh, you mentioning the West Fjords also made me think about the saga of Gisli's source son, which has a fair mm -hmm. amount of those landscape descriptions, often with uh, some kind of background story about why something is named what it is. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's why I, I'm I was sort of just taking this as uh, so one saga out of many. You can take them all. And uh, I think the entire corpus of the um, Eddas and Sagas I 
find what is so interesting about them is not that, of course, they reflect current learning in the 12th and 13th centuries of whatever was going on in continental, uh, the continental church and the books and the traditions that came with the uh, church as an institution to Iceland as to other cultures. But um, because the um, <clears throat> a few individuals in Iceland have somehow come up with the idea that this uh, technique of writing books and composing longer texts could also be applied to their own native tradition and memory culture, which was cultivated within the um, uh, so law sector, the lawmen. They, they, uh, we often think of them as. Um, reciting the oral law from beginning to end in three uh, three consecutive uh, years. But um, that, I think, is more of a, an idea of the written culture where the law is has been written down. And you have a book with the entire collection of law, with, and the book, of course, has a beginning and middle and end, which can be read in uh, that order. Whereas in the oral culture, it's more uh, situational. You have um, a problem, and then in order to solve that, then you do what? You contact the uh, local uh, lawmen, and then take they take it to the court, and they present your case, and you find a solution, and you reach an agreement, hopefully, or else you have to fight, fight it out between the protagonists. And um, this is exactly what the uh, family saga tradition is all about. How, how do you deal with uh, conflicts and legal issues? And this is the uh, storytelling tradition that, um, that must have been part of the uh, repertoire of the lawmen. And uh, Carol Clover, our um, uh, good professor in Berkeley, she was um, going on about how they uh, so were um, reflecting the situation in the uh, what we know as the courtroom, but the uh, the uh, the and we know the courtroom dramas that are so popular in the um, in the television culture and uh, similar so court not room but court dramas uh, are uh, in front of our eyes in the sagas. Everything that happens in the uh, sagas is something that can be derived from. Uh, and uh, reported from what witnesses would have uh, said in court about what happened in a certain case that is being being uh, discussed and debated in court. So um, the, she uh, had this speculation that perhaps we could write, write, rewrite the sagas into um, the uh, the courtroom form or the the courtroom uh, drama structure rather than have it uh, in, into the epic narrative. And, it probably uh, I, could. Yeah, and uh, I think that's a sort of fascinating idea to understand what sort of culture nurtured this, these sagas. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and then we see they are attached to the landscape. They are attached to people who lived in the landscape. We know about the place names, as you said, with Gisla Saga. This place is called so and so because this and that happened there, or it's named after a certain individual, and that individual has a family going back into the past, uh, all the way to Odin, if you like, and uh, also down to the present, to the uh, present time of the storytelling act. And um, so it's uh, you link the audience, the storyteller, the book, or the written saga, for that matter, uh, with the uh, landscape, with the people who have lived there, and back into the past as well. So the uh, lawmen within the Icelandic culture, they keep track of, so the chronology also, uh, in that, that uh, country, they know which lawmen came before them, how long they served, and then they have a set up line of lawmen back to 930 when the uh, the Althing was established in Iceland. And then you can attach uh, individuals and stories to that timeline, and you have a chronology going back um, at least that far in time. And uh, 
So I I was uh, uh, then developing this idea of the lawman being uh, central and responsible for this kind of memory culture surrounding the law and chronology within with Iceland and the other sort of memory elite, if that is the word we should use, would then be the poets, the court mm. poets, and they similarly. Uh, we see we have a sort of a glimpse into this world of uh, how they construct the uh, the past using this line of of uh, law speakers in the case of the uh, the uh, class of lawmen and uh, in the, uh, the the class of court poets they have the uh, lines of kings and earls in Scandinavia and attached to that the lines of of poets were the poets who served with the, the all the individual um, rulers and once you have the uh, poets associated with the rulers and you know the poems of the uh, of the poets that was the duty of the court poets that was their learning then you have um, uh, uh, poems uh, stories as associated with the poems and you have a timeline because you know when they were uh, uh, serving and uh, you have a chronology using that system going back from the um, time of of the writing in the 13th century back um, or around 1300 in the case of the Ipsaleta with this particular list of uh, both lawmen and uh, and poets is to be found uh, back uh, back to uh, the 9th century so uh, we have there an sort of insight as uh, uh, look at the method they had for keeping track of chronology several hundred years back into the uh, distant past and then they continue with genealogical lore so as we see in Inglingatal in Heimskringla that even reaches beyond that so such and such a king was the son of so and so and uh, who were, was the son of so and so and then they go back in back in time and ending up in or or back rather in the, uh, the time of the gods, the mythological time, and by we by the time we reach the gods, then we are already in the sky. So the gods live in the sky, as we uh, read in in Snorri's Edda in Gilvaginning and Gilvis illusion, and the mythological illusion in the text is that the sky, as we see it still today, is transformed into this. Um, mythological world where the gods live in their uh, halls and um, places that have different names and uh, and all kinds of events are, are um, happening around the movements and travels of the, uh, the individual gods. Uh, this is actually, I think, one of the most interesting and unique parts of your work is, is looking at star lore as embedded in uh, in, in the myths, such as in, in Snorri's prose. Um, I think it is really valuable the way that you've set up uh, talking about the kind of oral directions that are embodied in the landscape and the sagas. But you also see something very similar to that happening in the, the, the Eddic narrative with the, uh, the heavenly bodies. Can you talk a little bit about what what you see in terms of star lore being embedded in and Snorri's prose? Yeah, I, um, uh, if we um, just uh, run uh, through our minds of how uh, Gilvaginning, the first main part after the prologue of uh, Snorri's Edda is set up, is a king, uh, Swedish king that goes out into the wild and uh, he meets this these divine uh, threefold uh, character or characters and they starts asking uh, well, silly questions according to the uh, to the uh, divine figures about the world and they they sort of tell him a little do you know so and then they start explaining to him that what he sees with his uh, earthly human eyes is not what it actually appears to be and they transform so the uh, the best known and the, what everyone sees immediately the notion of what you call the rainbow that is not a rainbow in our 
mythological world, but it's a heavenly bridge that the gods can travel from earth uh, up into the sky or into into heaven. We are um, more used to that, perhaps a word being used in the Lord's Prayer. So our, our father, he resides in heaven, but we have uh, long, uh, long ago cheese to uh, take that literally. God, there's no God in heaven, literally, but um, in the, the mythological language, the um, we realize that it, this is the terminology we still use. We use the classical uh, Roman and Greek, Greek and Roman terminology for the sky now. But before uh, the Mediterranean culture spread uh, into and over uh, across the uh, what we refer to as the Western world, every different cultures had their own uh, astronomical uh, mythological terminology. They knew, you knew the names of the um, planets and they they had words for what we see in the sky and stories about <coughs> explaining it as um, as we know uh, and we call call myths and explaining why everything is as it is and um, and uh, this is exactly what is happening in um, in Kilvagini. They start by explaining that um, uh, there is this gigantic uh, world tree, the ash of Yggdrasil, and it's the uh, the three Norns are, are constantly pouring white mud from their Urdarbrunner um, or their well uh, over it to um, to keep it um, or prevent it from drying up. And we are told that everything that um, uh, gets this mud on it becomes so whitish and transparent, like the little um, membrane on the inside of an eggshell. And uh, if we now lo look up into the sky, and uh, if, we, if we imagine that we are Snorri's pupils in his hot tub in Reykholt on a dark night, and uh, he starts telling us this story about this white, transparent tree trunk, in the sky that is holding it all up. There is only one thing that um, we see that might remotely resemble that description, and that is the Milky Way. And uh, and then th that is sort of the first uh, cosmological or mythological interpretation of of the uh, of the world that uh, Snorri starts off with. And it's an ideal way to start if you are initiating your uh, your uh, students into this world of myths, you start with something that is obvious that you can easily detect in the sky. And then you start explaining what is all around it and uh, different locations, what you call them. And then you start detecting little uh, nuances in the, um, in the vocabulary, the mythological vocabulary that um, Wörlusbá tells us at the um, moment of creation when the gods were ordering uh, how to uh, calculate and uh, count uh, and make, uh, keep track of the uh, time. Uh, the sun is, uh, gets her halls and the stars uh, get their uh, places. And, uh, and when we think about the sky and how people talk about the sky, we uh, also know that all the um, uh, cultures make a difference between the uh, area in the sky that the sun travels through and then what is above and below from our here northerly uh, perspective. And uh, the path where the sun travels is what we know as the um, where the signs of the zodiac are located. So the 12 signs of the zodiac that uh, is a sort of fairly uh, widespread idea because the um, that part in the sky is divided up into 12 areas by the moon that uh, that moves slowly uh, and uh, we get a full moon or a new moon depending so 12 times a year every so often once in a blue moon we get 13 uh, and um, and uh, and then we can decide to divide it up in a different fashion into so every month into uh, quarters uh, or half months and so on. But that can be that depends on the culture, but it's the moon that is really dividing it up. And then the uh, the sun, 
slowly moves from one sign of the zodiac to another uh, during the year, making a full circle. This is all from our earthly perspective, of course. And if you make observe this for long enough, as people had in um, uh, the very early cultures that we know of, they they soon found out that the sun was not always in the same location relative to the sky behind. Uh, so, uh, uh, and it takes the sun so 2,000 years to um, move from uh, one sign to another at the same uh, time of year, same, same date as we count the dates. And that is why we now sing in the musical here about the um, age of Aquarius beginning around our, our time now. And that is because we have now been living for the past 2000 years at the age of the Piscus or, or fish. And that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, the significance of that is that um, the sun at the uh, spring equinox was moving into the sign of the uh, fish or Piscus uh, around the birth of uh, Christ. And now 2000 years later, it is moving uh, on this point in time at the spring equinox into the um, sign of the Aquarius. So, so this is something that the early cultures had already observed and was a basic knowledge among every elite member of learned classes. Whereas uh, now in our time, this uh, knowledge is more or less lost and gone. And um, the uh, myths of old, they, uh, they capture so these observations and these uh, ideas and we see some of this vocabulary even surviving down into the 19th century folklore when people are explaining um, uh, the sun and moon halos that uh, I don't know some of you may have observed when we have these large uh, circles around the uh, occasionally sun and we, more often we see it around the moon and then sometimes we see um, uh, what is referred to as a sun dogs or moon dogs on each side. So there's the uh, the big uh, shield of the sun or the moon, and then on both sides there are tiny little dots of light. And uh, these are the, um, in the 19th century folklore, explained with the uh, mythological terminology from the, uh, the uh, Viking Age as being the wolves that are running before and after the sun. And this uh, uh, peculiar story about siblings carrying the moon uh, uh, between them uh, is probably, uh, and Snorri tells us that this can be seen from Earth. This is probably a description of then also the, um, the moon dogs uh, carrying the moon on a pole, that is the, uh, the light that uh, is of, of, often seen between the um, two moon dogs going through the uh, the moon itself and so it's um so mythological terminology for real phenomena in the sky and this then us with the, all the stories that are attached to the landscape here down on the earth where we live is can be read or understood as um, uh, the people who practice this learning, this uh, vocabulary, they use the sky as a memory tool for their mythological lore. And this mythological lore was, by the time it is written down in Iceland in the 13th century, it's not um, pagan religion that is practiced uh, with rituals and all, but it's a, a knowledge of uh, stories and ideas and terms that uh, are essential for the court poets who are practicing the art of this exceptionally complicated skaldic uh, verbal art and for their images and for their vocabulary for their uh, for their uh, con the entire poetic construction you need the frame mythological frame of reference so they keep this knowledge alive with reference to the sky as their uh, main memory tool and Snorri is uh, one of the last professional poets who has been trained in, uh, in this oral culture as a professional oral court poet, but gets his 
a brilliant idea of transforming his entire, not entire, but part of his oral learning into a book for the beginners to be able to study it in, in book format, which he uh, realized as a young man in Otti was a very convenient way to study because he was studying these uh, oral arts that um, he specialized in uh, beside uh, young boys uh, who were studying to become servants uh, and clerics of the church. And they, of course, had books for everything they had to learn, whereas Snorri was studying uh, orally most of what he had to know. And folks, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I, I want to take a question that uh, Ranveig asked and kind of combine it with a, a question that occurred to me. So she says, do you think we are missing out on something by reading the oral compositions quietly by ourselves? And I want to add to that, are we missing something by having a broken tradition where we no longer have someone to point to us and tell us, you know, which, what, what story is, is being represented by what is happening in the sky, right? You know, is there a, mm -hmm. are, are we missing something by lacking someone to point out, you know, who the Odin star is that's sacrificing itself on the, the, the tree of the Milky Way or something like that? You know, our, our, have, do we have a real critical link in the storytelling chain broken here? Clearly, that, that is, I think, uh, one of the main problems we have when we are reading these uh, texts is that we don't know uh, how they how they were used and what was the context for their performance. Uh, what we have is, of course, uh, literary constructions in book forms uh, uh, that uh, were probably read out aloud for uh, for an audience rather than read in private and silence as as we are accustomed to reading, and <clears throat> so that is one thing they were they were read out loud. But what we also must keep in mind is that the um, the written version, even though that was performed as such, is also just a reflection of a, an oral culture that nurtured the. Um, the performances of the stories and the poems in some settings that we can only guess at. And um, as you say, we don't have the, uh, the teacher beside us to explain now what, what are the, um, when uh, the, uh, the divine uh, threefold character is pointing out to Gilvi all this phenomena in the sky. Uh, we don't know what they're pointing at. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas we can guess uh, that um, the, this white transparent tree trunk, that, that is, that is um, as Björn Jónsson, do medical doctor in Swan River in Canada, Manitoba, was the first to realize was um, most likely uh, pointing at the Milky Way. And uh, then we have this uh, terminology in Völuspá and in Snorrad about the halls and places that belong to the uh, sun and the stars, respectively. And then not forget the planets are not the same as the stars. Mm. The, the, uh, the planets are the, the, moving, the moving dots. And the, in the me medieval period, there are only five of those in addition to the moon and the uh, sun. So we have seven moving planets in the sky. So what we learn in school as being part of the solar system, so Uranus, Neptunus, and Pluto, and eventually some more, they didn't exist in the medieval period. And also, we have to not only think of these texts as being orally performed, and we not only miss that we don't have a teacher beside us pointing out the places, but also we have to think beyond the idea of us being on a planet in a solar system. We are on uh, not quite a flat Earth, but um, so, uh, a slightly swollen Earth. And the sky is above us, where all these heavenly bodies are moving. We, we still, with all our modern knowledge, we haven't changed the language that the sun still rises in the sky. Of course, it doesn't rise. We know that now from our physics classes that um, it's because the Earth sort of 
is moving and it's only an illusion that the sun rises. But we haven't changed the language. We still use this old mythological terminology about the movements of the sun. And the same for all the planets. And we fortunately we have, um, we bo both have the name names of the weekdays and we have a direct translation of uh, astronomical learned text in Latin in, into Old Norse or Icelandic around 1200. And there they make the equivalent as us, which is the same as with the days of the week, that uh, Tuesday is uh, Tis Daur, or, or the planet uh, Mars. Uh, Wednesday is uh, so Odin's day, and that is Mercury. And Odin is so the equivalent to Mercury. Thor's, uh, Thursday is uh, Thor's day. And uh, and that is uh, Thor is Jupiter in the um, in the sky, and and then uh, Friday is uh, either Freyr or Freya, and uh, these are also the same equivalent. Uh, so Ro Roman gods are used in the Roman languages for the for the weekdays, but this text that uh, spells this out for us also tells us that whoever is writing it doesn't know which uh, planet um, or which uh, which uh, god god's name was used for the planet saturnus so saturnus oh, remains uh, uh, a mystery some have guessed that perhaps saturnus was loki because loki is often sort of moving around as is uh, thor and uh, and uh, and odin and um, and so on so that is not unlikely but we don't have a have a source for that. And then when we start using these planet names for the, uh, we, so use the names of the gods for the planets and the planets they are moving, they are meeting in the sky in front of our eyes. So the sky gradually transforms into a gigantic uh, stage where with these actors and the firmament behind also has mythological names. These are locations where certain gods live, dwell. They are not moving anywhere. They are just staying put wherever they are. So it's only a, only a handful of gods can actually move and travel. The others stay put where they are and, uh, and doing their thing. So that's why gods have a function. So this one is doing that and the other is doing something else. And they just do it wherever they are. But a few of them get to move around and make the world move around and make it interesting and uh, enables us to see things happening and speculate what is going on in the uh, divine world up there in the heavens. That are, of course, there's more than one heaven also because everyone of making these observations realizes that um, these characters that now have names and are individuals, they don't cr crash. They quite often meet, but they they pass each other. So they each seem to have their own own heaven to move in. And uh, and in that world, people soon realized also that the moon was closest because all these phenomena could move behind the uh, moon. Mm. The sun can move behind the moon and the planets can move behind the moon. And uh, and so and then uh, the others uh, are uh, further out. So <clears throat> it's uh, it's uh, it's tricky for us to think back and try to understand the world as a logical world with mythological terms because um, uh, just as we see it with our bare eyes, because we mustn't forget that people thousand years, two thousand years, or. 6,000 years ago were equally uh, intelligent or stupid as we are. And they were equally scientific in analyzing the uh, data they had, which was just the observational data from observing the sky without all the uh, tools and techniques of our time. And they interpreted as logically as they could, given that they thought that there were divine factors at work in the, uh, in the world. And, how else could you explain the, the movement of, of like the sun or 
or the moon and so on. This doesn't just happen without some force being behind it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most intriguing parts about this idea that the sky is, um, is, is an illustration of what's happening in the stories that we've kind of lost the key for is that mm -hmm. it suggests that there's not so that at the same time that something is gained by writing it down, something is lost by writing it down. And that connects to a question that, that Alexandra asks. Uh, she says, very interesting talk. Many thanks. Uh, what is your theory why people during the Viking age decided not to write down their own stories? They knew what books were, but still preferred to pass their stories and poems on uh, orally. No, yeah, this is, uh, of course, uh, a matter, I think, of um, uh, how you formulate the question. And oral culture is uh, perfectly happy with uh, continuing practicing uh, the way they have always practiced uh, mediating knowledge and, uh, and doing their things, uh, uh, practicing um, their law and uh, and religion all orally. It's a very novel idea to write things down. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and it doesn't immediately, and that we just see from all over the world, it doesn't immediately occur to people to write everything down that they know. We know a lot of things that we never dream of writing down. Uh, and um, so the I, rather than asking why um, they didn't uh, decide to write write everything down, is I think it's more urgent to uh, ask why did they come up with the idea to write everything down, which they did in Iceland and not in the rest of Europe. All the cultures that were being Christianized in in Europe from from the south. They had their mythologies and all kinds of ways of uh, remembering the past and knowing uh, knowing their way around the world. But uh, they didn't uh, react to this culture of the book that came with, uh, with the church and brought with it a new religion and uh, a new way to uh, govern when states were being formed and so on. Uh, it didn't occur to them to... Um, and perhaps the old ways of uh, doing things didn't survive long enough for the written culture to to um, be available for uh, uh, in 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 time. So uh, so it, that is what is phenomenal with the Icelandic culture that these two memory elites, the lawmen, oral lawmen, and the oral court poets, they seem to have survived long enough as cultural institutions to become familiar with the art of writing that is first just confined to the church and whatever happens within the church. And uh, only uh, after that do uh, rulers realize that they can also use it to govern. And, and then after that, people realize, well, how about our stories and poetry? Shouldn't we write them down as well? Because it's much more entertaining to listen to stories and listen to poems and dance to poetry and sing poetry. And, but whereas once you've written it down, it becomes uh, dead. Just to uh, think of jokes when they are uh, written down. So stories that can be perfectly funny and acceptable when told when read out from a page, they just become dull and uh, lose somehow the, um, the entertaining aspect that they have as a live performance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, it's, it's more a question of why did they write it down? And I think that has to do again with status and um, identity. So uh, it becomes um, uh, somehow fashionable. That is also uh, something that we have to bear in mind. It's very expensive to pre prepare pergament for uh, bookmaking and to hire someone to write on it. Also, it, it, we need professional scribes. We need someone to, who knows how to make ink and 
prepare uh, 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 quill, the quill pens and so on. And so there's an awful lot of technique and money involved in making a book under these conditions. The Vikings, of course, had runes, but uh, they don't lend themselves to bookmaking. They are made to carve things on wood or in stone, uh, short messages and, uh, and uh, uh, not longer texts, nor not longer stories or anything of that kind. So, uh, and also uh, they have a certain amount of magic uh, attached to them. And uh, we know that uh, just the spoken word can be very effective. We still believe that we shouldn't say something that we don't want to happen because then it can somehow trigger the, um, the terrible thing to, uh, to actually happen if we say it out loud. Much more so if it's also written down, then it's sort of fixed and visible as well, not only audible. So there's, a, there's a, some magic and some, um, some power attached to the word, uh, not uh, additional power if it's also written down. And, um, and uh, it is in the 12th and 13th century, centuries, it becomes fashionable among sort of secular upper class people on the European continent to uh, entertain themselves with books. And this is a trend that Snorri Sturluson so, uh, plugs into, realizes that he can make himself sort of, uh, important in the uh, courtly settings in, uh, in Norway with uh, uh, still another uh, text with uh, stories about the um, royal historiography of Norway and adding on much of this skaldic poetry that he has been... Um, uh, well, I shouldn't say forced, but made to, to learn as a young aspiring uh, poet training to become um, uh, a professional in the art. So uh, he clearly knows much more poetry than um, than anyone uh, who was or, or thought it perhaps important to put it into writing, which others had not thought of in the same same manner. And then he starts developing this idea, writing this te textbook for young poets with the previously oral learning, and then writing, a, 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 a initiating or supervising the writing of Egil um, Skallagrimsson, the saga of him. That's all part of the um, upper class culture of his time, that um, you show off your wealth, show off your status by being able to commission the writing of books and then entertain your guests with um, book reading. Not only so the religious texts that you hear in church, but you are now also equally learned, important and powerful and rich as the um, institution here that uh, is running the, um, running the show. And I, I also can um, entertain you, my friends, here with a secular text about my forefather in, in Snorri's case. So please enjoy. So it's a social status thing. And, uh, and just one clue, clue, clue we have about um, what these, uh, uh, these star signs could have been named in the same text that uh, translates the, uh, the uh, names of the planets or gives us the equivalents for the planets, except for Saturnus. They tell us that um, what is referred to in um, as the Hyades in the Taurus sign uh, is a, it's a sort of V-shape sign that, uh, well, uh, looking at the camera, it's supposed to be open on the um, on the left side from uh, from our perspective. I see on my screen that. Um, it's open on the left, but I don't know if it turns out that way for you. In, you know, in the Taurus yes. sign, so so the sun, uh, and it's this is called the wolf's mouth by the pagans, the text tells us. And as it happens, it is exactly on the sun's path in the sky. Oh, and the sun and the sun moves here from from uh, out of the wolf's mouth once a year. And uh, you can imagine someone who has this terminology for the sky and knows where the sun is moving, 
and for that you need some some knowledge of the sky because you don't see it when it happens you have to just know what is behind the sun when the sun is shining those who see that happening every year in the sky or know that this is happening by the sun time the sun has got out of the wolf's mouth you know that you escaped once once a year once again the ragnarok the the mouth of the wolf did not wolf did not close down on the sun so you are safe for uh, another year so but where where is this written out is this in hoiksbog no no this is in the gks uh, 812 this equivalent okay. of the the hyades 812 quarto okay and uh, and so this is uh, i think a very important uh, little a clue clue to how people saw so this and if, as I say, if this is the wolf's mouth, and this is happening in May or May and June, this movement out of the wolf's mouth. So I have been speculating perhaps these um, this uh, maypole, as it's called, which uh, people in northwestern Europe dance around in May or June. It depends. The date is uh, not all, uh, the same everywhere. Perhaps that uh, celebration can be associated with the uh, with the uh, annual escape of the uh, sun out of the wolf's mouth mm. uh, at this around this time of the year, and this of course changes gradually uh, through the millennia, because the uh, as with the spring equinox, this uh, this escape is not so. Sort of uh, so if, if we count in thousand years, it's not always at the exactly the same same spot. So, what? Uh, That's fascinating, so, and I need to look at this this manuscript. It, it is digitized on hundred.is, right? Yeah, yeah, and and this is so published in the Alfredi Islensk, so okay. uh, most uh, unliterary text, but uh, with a lot of. Uh, the, uh, the scholarly texts that were being translated into Icelandic. So there's astronomical texts translated from Latin and mathematical texts and so on. All kinds of um, so learning that uh, were, was at people's disposal at this time. And, um, and these uh, few observations in the text are from my sort of mythological secular perspective perhaps the most interesting, not that they were learning, of course, everything that was available in the Latin sources, but that they were adding this information that in their own language, in their own pre-Christian terminology, this was called this, that, and the other. So. Mm. And I, I think I've seen this manuscript and I think that, I, you know, somewhere it, some of this kind of flew over my head because I just thought, oh, well, you know, these are just translations of, of Latin learning and I hadn't paid it much mind. No, no that, um, is, uh, that is why um, people haven't uh, been as interested in it as, um, as the uh, well, more mythological texts, but uh, it's... Uh, yeah, I'm guilty. Oh. <laughs> uh, it, but, you know, I think that really one of the most valuable parts of, of, of this idea is, is this notion of memory cultures and thinking about how in Iceland, these old elite memory cultures survived where they didn't on the continent and survived long enough to make use of the new method of presenting information and in, in, in writing. It makes me think a little bit about, well, I mean, in a sense, academics today are a memory culture although we use writing quite a bit, um, mm -hmm. there are certain things that are sort of, you know, the, part of the etiquette or, 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 or part of the method that academics learn they don't necessarily write about. Um, and that in a sense, we have a memory culture that is adjusting to yet another new uh, way of presenting information, which is with, you know, all these interconnected computers. But mm -hmm. that, that links to something that Blake asked, which 
contrast that learned culture to the, the average person. Uh, he asked, so would you suggest that the learned poets understood all or almost all of the myths as referring to astronomical things? And meanwhile, the sort of ordinary Norse people, would they have also understood it this way? Or would they have a more literal or more anthropomorphic idea of the gods? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is a, a very central question, of course, and um, and um, can be answered probably in many, many different ways. And uh, But it, it's uh, tricky. So how, as I said with the other question, how, how do we formulate how do we uh, formulate the question? And uh, what, what is within our power or what knowledge do we have to address, uh, address the question? Well, first, we have to remember that all these stories about the gods that we have, they are more or less confined to um, the prose and poetic Edda that were written in Iceland in the 13th century. So written by a Christian male who was uh, trained professionally to become a, a court poet using mythological imagery. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, clearly as a poet uh, must have valued Odin quite a lot. So the uh, god of poets and uh, verbal art. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> then uh, the poetic Edda, not written by Snorri, but in the same sort of cultural surroundings. Snorri is uh, using the, many of the poems that we also know from the poetic Edda. And, um, and uh, we uh, have become accustomed to using these sources from these upper-class males in uh, probably the west of Iceland. We can even confine it to that. Uh, west or northwest of Iceland. Uh, as a uh, so general uh, view of what people in Scandinavia in Viking times uh, thought and told about the gods. Perhaps that is uh, so taking too big a jump in, uh, in one go. First, I think we have to really understand what is going on with, the, um, with, uh, with our sources. And, and this overall, I think that is uh, also something that we don't quite uh, always acknowledge is that this overall understanding of the um, sky and the the entire sort of mythology is in at all times an elitist um, knowledge. This is something what that only the initiated uh, have a full command of. Uh, the ordinary, if if we use that word, so people who are not in this upper class uh, courtly circles where you entertain yourself and your audience with these very complicated court poems that they are so complicated they were also complicated in the um, medieval period in the Viking Age they were meant to be complicated that was part of the fun or most of the fun that uh, they were meant not to be understood so you had to figure out and think and contemplate and 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 to really um, study the ver verse before you uh, realized what was going on in it. So this was not uh, folk poetry in any sense. Not not pe that people would be uh, using for the celebrations at their uh, around the maypole or whatever they were uh, dancing and singing around. So. So, but when it comes to so the practice of uh, uh, pagan uh, religious or cultic um, uh, some practices, we are more or less uh, lost. The sources are not telling us anything about that. They are telling us about this uh, narrative poetic culture of the upper class uh, males that were uh, using their art to entertain and make money, of course, at the uh, at the uh, royal courts in um, in uh, Scandinavia, and uh, looking for fame and and glory based on their uh, verbal poetic skills, uh, 
constructing complicated words that were not meant to be enjoyed by all. And uh, so this is uh, the world that uh, they were living in. And also this exclusive knowledge is uh, part of the power game of the time. So uh, it's the same now. The knowledge is power. And in, in uh, as far as we know back in Egypt, so knowledge of... Um, of the sky and the uh, and the time, how how the uh, when when the river Nile would flood and so on, that knowledge was what um, uh, made the upper class as powerful as as they were because they knew when the flood would be coming, they knew when the, to make their sacrifices in order to uh, ask the gods to help with the flood and so on because they could keep track of time with the ordinary people couldn't quite figure out in the same exact way. Yeah. So the, this uh, exact keeping track of time, which you need the um, understanding of the um, sky to do, this is what uh, sort of makes you a part of the, um, the uh, knowledgeable uh, elite in the culture. And the uh, the folk, the ordinary folk, if we talk about them, they would know, of course, certain stories and and have ideas about their gods that they would use in their everyday practice. And they would tell some stories as as today. We know a few star signs and perhaps the odd star, and uh, but very few people would actually be able to understand the entire system and how the um, sun moves from here to there and when the moon is in this house as it's called which refers to the um, the halls of the um, of the sun mm -hmm. uh, where the uh, where, where the moon is located and so this is uh, something that you um, that you study and become a specialist in and uh, the ordinary folk would only have a superfluous uh, understanding of knowledge of i would think you, you need it to, oh, sorry, no. No, please, please. No, no, but of course you need for uh, navigational purposes and so on, you need um, mm -hmm. need uh, some skill in that matter, even though that doesn't help you in the North Atlantic because you only sail in the summer where the sun, when the um, stars are not visible. So, mm -hmm. but further south you need that, of course. And by the way, we, so we've taken about an hour of your time if you need to go or need to tell us that you have, you know, a time you've got to exit by, uh, no, no, let us fine, know. I'm don't... fine. I'm okay. So I'm fine. If um, we, we don't want to eat up more more questions, there, yeah, there are. Um, let me let me just just get to, to these. So Peter asks, is there evidence that the myths were acted out dramatically and not just recited orally? Would that be another way of remembering them? Yeah, well, that uh, that uh, again uh, a very exciting uh, problem or exciting question, and uh, and uh, we like to like to believe that um, the myths somehow they cannot survive and unless there is some orally and unless they are performed somehow. And uh, Terry Gunnell has in particular written on this and. Um, he was the first to really um, use the marginal uh, marks on um, in in the Cotis Ritius manuscript, uh, we, because some of the poems there they are not all all sort of narrative poems by one uh, sort of poet who is uh, reciting his or her poem, but some of them are there's conversational poets. They're they're all in uh, direct speech. Uh, a certain character says something and then another character says something and there's nothing in the poetic text that tells you who is speaking. But then you have on the margins of the manuscript uh, indications as to the speaker in which verse with uh, so, so and so quad, so and so quad, so uh, abbreviated. An and example is uh, Trimsky, though, right? Or, uh, yeah, or yes, yeah, 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 and uh, and Harpar's and mm -hmm. and so on, and uh, so uh, Terry and others had argued this with Skirtnismal that uh, Skirtnismal cannot really be performed unless there is some dramatic uh, performance 
involved. The text does not give you the information as to when the scene shifts or who is speaking, who is speaking to whom, unless you are somehow acting it. You can do it as a single individual, but much better with uh, more people playing out the, uh, the scenes. And uh, similarly with these uh, uh, conversations, there's no way you can figure out who is speaking, like in Lokasenna also, uh, without uh, so somehow visualizing that. Mm -hmm. A single performer, of course, can be very good at uh, jumping back and forth and changing character, and now I'm this one and now I'm someone else, and, and change their voice and so on. But you can also think of more people than, um, than a single performer being active in this and certainly the way the uh, the poems are written in the uh, the manuscript which is written in the late 13th century this is a certain method that and that is what terry demonstrated that can be found in manuscripts in north of france and england from the 12th and early 13th century with texts that we know are intended for dramatic performance okay yeah so we can uh, conclude that whoever is putting these poems into the uh, Cotis Reaches of the Elder Edda thinks of these particular poems as fit for dramatic performance because he adds these, these uh, bits and, uh, and uh, th this information in. And we can also see that this is part of the original writing because the way it is written, sometimes when the speaker changes in the middle of a line, then... The, this information is added in the uh, in the text and in, in the main text, so as not to confuse the whoever is performing it. So, uh, <clears throat> so in the 13th century, the writer that this we can say with uh, certainty thought of these poems as fit for dramatic performance. But how far back in time can we take that? Does that mean that these poems were part of a dramatic ritual in the 10th century? We don't know. They, these are oral texts. They are constantly changing and they can probably be um, or, or could probably have been performed in many different ways. You could, uh, if you are a clever and good performer, you can uh, uh, perform and you can add in information as to who is speaking and it, it, you needn't be be so, uh, uh, so tied up with just the uh, direct speech in your performance. You can add in and then so-and-so came along and said, ba ba ba. And um, so there are many ways of performing these poems without, and we shouldn't think of the texts we have as something that uh, uh, was uh, performed exactly word for word in that way for, um, for many hundreds of years. We must always remember that oral texts are fluid and they change from performance to performance, from performer to performer, and so on. So there is no uh, no nothing that we can call a fixed fixed text or fixed or single one performance for that matter. And and it occurs to me that those marks, you know, so and so kva uh, in the margins, we see that beyond just the transmission of the Eric material, because I think that's in Fagerskina in Eric's mouth, and I think it's in Kringla in Hakonar mouth, the marginal notes about who's speaking. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not certain, but it, 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 this is so quite often used in these texts as to so and so quad, so the, the stanzas are, um, are introduced with that uh, phrase quite often. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, I, I'm not, uh, I, um, I haven't noticed that this is so on the margins in Fagurskina also, but, um, but uh, that is, uh, Terry was uh, anyhow the first to interpret it, this in a sort of systematic fashion and um, realize that this was part of uh, a tradition of uh, committing dramatic texts to the parchment in the 12th and 13th century. So that is one of these um, rare discoveries in our fields. So yeah, most often we are just 
just just debating theories and um, and ideas and uh, trying to squeeze some new perspectives out of what everyone has read already. Yeah, right. His work is very valuable. I, I think the last time I saw him was at the same conference in Berkeley. I saw you. Mm. And... Okay, so you missed him this summer here in Dresden. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I did. I didn't see so him far. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, Elena asks, uh, this idea of knowledge is power, court poetry is being leap entertainment, reminds me of a question I've wondered about riddles for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, were they meant to be questions with one actual answer, like testing knowledge, or were they meant to test cleverness and a person's ability to spin a plausible meaning on the fly? Yeah, that, uh, that is, um, like many of these riddles, is a tricky question. So, and, uh, and we see in these um, contests in the literature that, that um, uh, these uh, mythological characters get into a riddle context contest and um, and uh, finally when you cannot um, answer the ultimate question as to what uh, Odin whispered uh, uh, into uh, in Baldur's ear the um, the uh, the uh, the person the only person who knows that is uh, is Odin of course so and you, no one can answer that, and uh, those who get the question they cannot answer, they pay with it uh, with their lives. So um, riddles clearly um, are important in the culture, and it's not a not a trivial matter to uh, go into a contest of uh, wisdom as uh, as uh, it is. So many of these riddles that we have, they are constructed around. Again, so mythological terminology. So, what is this and that called in um, in in uh, and uh, in that setting? And we know in um, in the poem Alvismaur in the Edda again, and that is another so, uh, so thing to uh, help us understand this mythological terminology about the sky. Is that we have a whole poem dedicated to this idea that. Uh, 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 the same phenomena has different names in the different worlds. And the different worlds are, of course, the world, uh, world here that we live in, humans on Earth, and then the elves and dwarves and gods and giants and all kinds of other creatures, they, uh, they have other different vocabulary in their worlds for the same phenomena. And, uh, and as I say, so the... Um, Calling the Milky Way the ash of Yggdrasil is only one way of probably naming it. You can have other names for it as well, as you can have for the rainbow. And, and that is how the we, we are so certain about that because we that has lived on and that is spelled out for us in the prose text as well. So, but Alvis Maul teaches us that uh, there were lots of other words. That, that could be used depending on which world you are in. And clearly in the world of the gods, you have this mythological vocabulary. And that is what King Gilby of Sweden is being initiated in. He, they deem him worthy of explaining the world to him in mythological terms. And when the lesson is over, so the uh, illusion disappears and he just stands out in the... Uh, world as we still stand in it with the sky above him and none of these mythological phenomena in front of his eyes because they were just created with the art of storytelling hmm. and uh, or which creates the illusion so the idea of riddles being um, a powerful somehow again also a memory tool and a way to display your knowledge i think is uh, something that um, we should take seriously. But again, be careful that uh, our sources are very limited and uh, they, they all come from roughly the same period. And uh, we must move very slowly in um, taking what they have to tell us in the 13th century back into the um, distant past, even though they must have some prehistory behind them that 
goes back into the pre-Christian period. But things must have been very different back then from what they were in the 13th century. Mm -hmm. But I, I was thinking when you, you, you mentioned about uh, the, the story falling away and just the stars being above you. I, you know, I've spent a fair amount of my life in areas with very dark night skies, so I, you can see all the, the stars. Um, and it's interesting how it draws your eyes like, the, like a fire does, right? If you're mm -hmm. out in that darkness, just sleeping under the stars, uh, it, it does draw your attention. It, and and it, impressionistically, I can see how one would start constructing stories with those as a guide, just because people's eyes are being drawn toward them like, like they are toward a, toward a fire. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. So, sorry. Oh, oh, I thought you were sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I can, I can also comment on that, and I think uh, that is um, exactly just what we must remember that uh, mankind has uh, been here on the planet for uh, quite some time now, and this sky has been above generations before us for um, quite a long time, and this is a uh, one one of the first things and the only only thing that. Um, constitutes so the early science uh, when um, the human brain becomes capable of the uh, thinking that um, that uh, we enjoy still today and that that brain has been uh, so walking the planet for um, for a long time now contemplating exactly what what is up there in the sky and long ago, people just figured this out, figured out the system, how, how it moves, how the firmament moves so slowly, how these seven planets move within that firmament, and how it changes with the seasons. And people very early on started marking out the main points of the year, of course, the winter and summer solstice, also the equinoxes. These are very classical points that people have marked, either with um, some structures, man-made structures, or with um, uh, locating themselves in the landscape so that uh, mountains or cliffs or something would, um, would align uh, to mark these, uh, these uh, main points of the year. Uh, these these uh, structures can focus on the sun, or they can focus on the um, on the moon, because the moon makes uh, so it takes uh, so tw twenty years for the moon to uh, make a sort of full full cycle, and uh, and then it starts all over again. Or else you could could as with the uh, pyramids in Egypt, they aligned the pyramids with the um, rising stars. So that, that is actually a, a very exact way of finding a true north. It will not just use the polar star, which is high up in the sky, but know exactly where on the horizon a certain star rises in, uh, in, a, in a true north. And uh, then if you figure that out, and you can use that for a while. After several hundred years, that is no longer the case. So it has everything always is moving a bit because the... Um, the earth is wobbling a bit, but uh, people didn't, of course, know why that happened. But they, uh, so this had to be recalculated. But that is how people can also date some of the um, uh, structures in Egypt is that they were using a certain star to align the, um, the, uh, the buildings. And then the star would go slightly off through north. And then the buildings would still be aligned according to that star until it was um, too far off. So a new new star had to be found. And then you can date the building as to how exact it is relative to the star that was being used. So, oh, that's neat. So it, it's uh, uh, so very exact ways to measure things without any of our modern technology. Only if you realize. So how the sky works, 
and in the Pacific, people navigate with with this, not using any uh, any tools, just knowing the sky by heart. Where where on the horizon the different stars rise on the different different days of the year, and if you know that, all that, then you know exactly all the directions around you all the time. Mm. You don't t- need to have a sextant or uh, figure out the uh, the uh, height of the sun or um, or or anything like that. So you just know where on the horizons the horizon the sun comes at. And it's a huge you know, you have sophist- to, Yeah, you have to know the day. The, yeah. the, it's hugely sophisticated, yeah, yes, sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah, so all, all I'm saying, a very sophisticated toolbox that, that mm. so many of us have just forgotten about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't know how to navigate by the stars. I, I have a tiny bit more star knowledge than maybe uh, I, I would by default just from being out in the dark a lot. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know a fifth of the stuff that I would need to navigate by the stars. No, no, you you need uh, so you, you need people with um, time on their hands, mm-hmm. and and you need people to study this systematically. This is not um, what once you uh, get to that stage to navigate the Pacific, you have to really um, spend time on accumulating that knowledge. Okay. And you need good and, teachers. Yes, yes, you you have to uh, train. And uh, I uh, remember having read something about a sort of a stone structure on Hawaii that um, is a, assimilates a, a boat. So, and uh, uh, the the writer was uh, sort of explaining that uh, this could be used as a sort of classroom, the, the boat with a view of the entire horizon. So you can put your students in the boat and then... Um, so learn the uh, learn the sky from from there and and uh, adjusting of course your knowledge to to the boat stone boat that you're in so so you remember the directions relative to the boat you you are you are sailing so it's on uh, where on on your boat the star comes up that's a neat so it, so it's uh, it's uh, something that has to be studied, but once you master it and you understand how it works, then you just live by it. And on a, a somewhat different note, a question from Blake, who was wondering if you would comment on the, uh, the difference between the story of Thor and uh, the Mythgarzorma in uh, Snorri's prose edda and in Hymiskvila. He says there are two stories with a similar plot, but a lot of details mm-hmm. change, mm-hmm. suggesting mm-hmm. variation mm-hmm. in oral tradition. Would you have any mm-hmm. remarks? About yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, I have um, written on this and also the many um, skaldic verses that, um, that uh, are associated with that story. And uh, most of them uh, mention the, uh, the ice meeting uh, of Thor and 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 the Midgardsholmer, so how horrific that uh, sight was and so on, and uh, we uh, uh, quite often hear that um, so Snorri is constructing his myths uh, from poetic sources, so using these fragmentary. In, in in this instance, fragmentary uh, skaldic verses and hymiskvida to uh, then so retell the the myth in prose, and uh, I think perhaps um, we are there dealing with a too modern conception of what Snorri was doing. We think of him as a scholar like us, and as an uh, archaeologist or a textual scholar who has uh, some sources here on the desk and we have to somehow reconstruct a, a culture or some ideology out of these fragmentary sources and uh, and then we forget that Snorri was trained in that culture so he still knew how to tell these stories he didn't have to reconstruct them from fragmentary poems 
And this particular myth is a, a excellent, I think, example to demonstrate that because um, uh, Snorri deviates, if that is the word we want to use, from the uh, from the Attic poem. But uh, perhaps that's a wrong word to use because then we assume that the Attic poem is somewhat uh, right or original or correct, and Snorri is making a mistake or going away from the original. So if we were uh, folklorists or anthropologists collecting data with uh, interviews going into the field, we would um, appreciate meeting a character like Snorri who could tell us uh, all the stories, all the poems he knew. We would also know that he wouldn't know everything if we interviewed someone else on the next farm or in the next valley or in uh, even uh, in the next uh, quarter of the country, we would get different stories, different poems, and so on. So no one is telling the same stories, same poems uh, from farm to farm, from generation to generation, or uh, or uh, within the same family even. So we would treat everything Snorri would have to tell us as um, first class information from an informant in the field. We would not treat him as a scholar who is uh, doing something similar to us. So then, then we, we have Snorri's account, we have uh, Himiskvida, and then we have all the Skaldic verses. And once we start thinking about them, we also see all the Skaldic verses that are usually referred to as many and coming from different poems. They all come from single uh, chapter in Snorri's Skaldskapamál, where they are put into a coherent order. Uh, to explain how you can um, formulate a kenning about Thor. And um, so there they are put in, in an order again that can be read and interpreted as still another version of the story, told in different skaldic stanzas. So then we have a third version. None of, none of the skaldic stanzas or Himiskvila mention anything about the... Um, when Thor is pulling Milka's armor up and pushing through the boat with his feet. So and then somehow mysteriously he reaches the bottom of the sea and can walk ashore, so the boat breaks. And So why was it, why was it that deep then that he was fishing for the, uh, for the Milka's armor on, on the boat? Of course, we cannot ask these uh, logical questions of the myths. But um, this little detail that uh, he pushes through the boat with his feet is not in any of these po poems that we have. So if we are thinking of Snorri using them as a source, then we have to think, well, he must be making this up. Or... But then we have this um, uh, stone uh, erected, uh, still standing uh, west of Uppsala with uh, the Thor smiths on them. One of the few uh, picture stones with mythological material on them that we can be reasonably certain must be referring to Thor because there are so many details and and uh, that we cannot really interpret it any in any other way that than they are reflecting similar versions of the myths as we know from the Icelandic sources. And there on the stone we have Thor's little foot coming down through the boat, telling us that the, that version of the story was circulating uh, west of Uppsala, about 40 kilometers west of Uppsala, when the stone was erected, and also in Snorris, was also in Snorris mind when he wrote it down in the 13th century. So the only plausible explanation for that is not that Snorri is reconstructing anything from the poems, but that he is a genuine uh, the source about the myths that were being told in Iceland as well as in Scandinavia. I think that's a through, really through many many centuries. A really important note to make about Snorri. You know, a, a, a fair amount of the community online that gets enthusiastic about Norse mythology gets down on Snorri. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You know that he's. You know, the, the words Christian influence come up a lot with this. Mm -hmm. um, 
but that he is such an important single written source sometimes for elements like the the foot through the boat that we know are old uh suggests that he's you're you're right he he's he is a, he is his own independent source he's not just a secondary source of the poetic edda and 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 i need that reminder sometimes myself too mm-hmm. um i will have to go before too very long uh We'll have but, to have uh, you back. But you, you, you mentioned Christian influence in Snorri, but Christian influence is also in the Attic poems. Oh, so all, all of these texts are uh, influenced or infiltrated, if you like. Or uh, they are, uh, okay. because uh, we don't have any um, true pre-Christian uh, right. stories written in, in Iceland in the 13th century. They have all been told and retold in different uh, uh, ages by different generations influenced by current ideas at all times yeah so well, they, they have kept something of the old but they have also added something of the new but perhaps if we think of them as a reflection of the uh, sky the sky has kept them somehow stable mm-hmm. also right there's, I, all, I think... there's, there's only so much that the, you can't deviate because you're always explaining the same uh, phenomena that is visible to all and you need always to uh, uh, mediate this the same or similar mythological terminology because you are always talking about the same thing it's like with the language the language continues but it changes constantly but still some of some of it remains stable and other things are more flexible same with the myths, I think. Well, and, and beyond that, I think that, uh, you know, there's this notion that Christian influence means that whatever you're reading is illegitimate, but it's mm-hmm. still part of the same continuing oral tradition, no, right? No, it's no. not, there, there's not some some point at which that continuing oral tradition becomes bad, right? It's still, oh, no. No, no. It's, no, no. It's, it's, it's one continuous tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, since... I have to go before too long. Can I pick a last question to ask you from the comments? And then we've got to do this again and have you back to talk about more of this. I could perhaps, if there are some leftover questions, we could uh, answer them in writing later on. Sure, Sure, that that makes perfect sense. Mm. And uh, if you'd be willing to come back, we'd love to have you back. This has been a fascinating discussion. I think one of our, our most gripping interviews actually people have been very positive in the comments here okay um, well, i'm glad you uh, you um, gave me the chance to talk to you oh it's it's been amazing and, it, and it's great to see you again great to be back in touch after after not uh, seeing you for a long time likewise and thank you for your excellent translations also they are very uh, very appealing for a new reader i think Thank you. Of the, yes. of the Edda. So I, I'm thinking, no, sorry. I was just saying, it means a lot coming from you. Well, thank you. That's not my, 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 my gratitude. Uh, I'm thinking of the, how we go about the chat here. Can I go into the, um, into the somehow recording later and, uh, and uh, write the answers or how can I, um, well, because I, I get... don't have much time now to sort of, Complete it, but um, can we open it? Open the thread again. Yes. After this is recorded, I get a um, transcript of the chat, so I can just email you the questions that we didn't get to. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So that should be pretty easy. Well, thank mm-hmm. you very much, Kisa, and uh, I hope you have a good rest of your evening over in in Iceland. And no. uh, we'll hope to see you again. And till then, um, wish you and everyone else all the best. Okay. Like likewise. Thank you. All right. Bye. All, all the best, everyone.